I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Eric Skipper and start up with cardioplegia. Thank you, Joe. Um, hopefully people will find this informative and not uh, too terribly boring, but we'll give it a shot. So I really have no conflicts relative to this presentation. I do consulting, receive some grant support and research support from a, a few corporations, but nothing that really has any relevance to this discussion. So this is uh, Carolina's Medical Center. It's a part of Atrium Health, which uh, was previously named Carolina's Healthcare System. That name change occurred probably within the last month. Uh, it's a quaternary care system, uh, quaternary care hospital for Carolina's healthcare system, now Atrium Health. Uh, this is uh, my uh, mentor colleague, uh, Dr. Robicek, who in uh, was putting together a rotating disc oxygenator in his garage in 1956. And I think we can all agree that things have come a long way since then. In 1956, cardiac protection involved hypothermia. That was what you did. That was the only tool you had. And things have clearly evolved uh, since then. Intermittent cross clamp. Yes. So our objectives are uh, fairly straightforward. We're gonna do a hist history and overview of cardioplegia, review of what's in the literature, and relevant conclusions, i.e., where do we go from here? So early techniques were uh, to arrest the heart, as I alluded to, predominantly involved hypothermia, either systemic and or topical. And you can find literature in the 50s uh, from Dr. Bigelow, Dr. Shumway, and up into the 70s from Dr. Swan. Global ischemia with continuous or intermittent aortic occlusion was popularized in the early 60s. But, uh, but along that time, people also started to look at aortic root or direct coronary perfusion with blood. Uh, ventricular fibrillation was also a technique that was utilized. But none of these were perfect, and none of these really solved the myocardial protection strategy. Uh, these were supplemented by resting the heart using, quote, cardioplegia, unquote, in the 70s. And by the early 80s, which doesn't seem that far away for a few of us sitting at the table, uh, people began to understand that the salient properties of cold chemical cardioplegia were basically divided into three components chemical arrest, hypothermia, and additive protection by preventing or reversing unfavorable ischemia-induced cellular changes. Blood as a cardioplegic vehicle arose from protagonists of the 70s, gained popularity into the 80s, and really uh, came unto its own by the early to mid-1990s. Adequate myocardial protection became known as an essential optimal component to achieve necessary clinical outcomes. Hyperkalemic cardioplegic solutions have been the gold standard since the 1970s. Electromechanical arrest is achieved through depolarization of the extracellular membrane potential. Uh, this decreases the resting potential of the cardiac myocytes. Uh, this is achieved by delivery of cold potassium-enriched solution directly down the coronaries, either by the aortic root, by the coronary ostea, or retrograde. Uh, electromechanical quiescence is sustained and must be maintained. So for a lot of the earlier cardioplegic solutions, this required readministration every 20 to maybe 30 minutes. There are a multitude of available cardioplegic solutions, as you saw from the title, and that was only a few. There's really been no clear consensus. Surgeons love to believe that what they use is the perfect solution. That hasn't changed for decades. Blood-based solutions have been associated with significant reduction in periop cardiac biomarkers and periop reperfusion mediators. But no clear demonstration of superiority with regard to outcomes has really been clinically demonstrated. If we look at a meta-analysis from 2008, which is based on a small cohort, looking at small cohort groups, uh, this shows blood cardioplegia to be superior to crystal blood cardioplegia. But when this was looked at for large cohort groups in a study published in 2004, 
the difference wasn't as uh, impressive and it became more difficult to prove when one looked at large cohort groups. It's difficult to comparatively evaluate the various solutions because there are a lot of variables. Substrate composition, delivery routes, delivery temperatures, dosing frequency, and also any number of patient-associated variables. If one turns to the infamous uh, medical search engine Google, we find that there's some 300 plus thousand entries for cardioplegia. And if we limit it to scholarly randomized studies for adult cardioplegia, there's still almost 100,000. When one looks at the literature, it starts to look like vegetable soup. You have Buckberg, Del Nido, Microplegia, Plegisol, St. Thomas, um, Custodial. There, there's any number of solutions. So what can we learn from the literature and how is this being translated into current clinical practice? Well, we know that in the U.S. and most of Western Europe, um, blood cardioplegia is the preferred cardiac protective strategy. Uh, this has synergistic components, including hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, buffering agents, hyperosmolarity and hyperglycemia, as well as glutamine and aspartate uh, to replenish uh, Krebs cycle depleted amino acids during the uh, cardioplegic arrest. Standard application, cold induction, reperfusion or reinfusions at appropriate intervals, and a warm terminal reperfusion in some instances. Advanced strategies can include warm induction, controlled, hyper, or controlled reperfusion, and leukocyte filtration. Other strategies can look at continuous warm retrograde, intermittent warm antegrade, tepid antegrade. So you can see there are any number of variables uh, literally looking at temperature alone. If we look at a study from 2012 to look at differences between blood crystalloid cardioplegia uh, versus um, uh, or blood versus crystalloid cardioplegia, uh, one sees first that this was over a broad period of time, 1966 to 2011. And I think we can all agree that things changed a bit during that time interval. But they looked at 36 studies, five plus thousand patients, about half of which were blood cardioplegia and half of which were crystalloid. There was no difference in death, MI, or low cardiac output syndrome. And no superiority could be really demonstrated with myocardial protection between those two strategies. If we look at this other study by Aldemir, uh, this looks at plegisol versus modified St. Thomas cardioplegia, looking at particularly the development of ventricular fibrillation after aortic cross clamp removal. Uh, first of all, it's a retrospective study. Um, most patients had modified St. Thomas, but a reasonable number had plegisol. And the outcomes basically showed that uh, there was a higher incidence of V-fib upon declamping with plegisol alone versus modified St. Thomas. If one looks at uh, blood cardioplegia, uh, looking at uh, a Medline uh, kind of composite study, meta-analysis, five studies were chosen and that represented 296 patients. Uh, the data was looked at with regard to low output syndrome, spontaneous return of sinus rhythm, volume of cardioplegia given, and perioperative MI. Uh, as one might assume, microplegia use less volume. But with regard to the incidence of low output syndrome, spontaneous return to sinus rhythm, and periop MI, there was no difference. Larger randomized control trials were felt to be needed. This study looking at polarizing microplegia uh, in patients with unstable angina from 2013 looked at 80 patients. They were randomized between microplegia and four to one Buckbird blood cardioplegia. Uh, they found that the microplegia had a lower troponin and lower lactate levels from coronary sinus uh, effluent uh, as well as post-op, a higher wall motion score higher cardiac index, higher cardiac cycle efficiency, lower transfusions, shorter hospital length of stay, 
and a trend toward lower need and duration of inotropes during the ICU stay. However, one has to be careful because the microplegia group was a later cohort than the Buckberg cardioplegia group. And as we know, things did evolve somewhat between 2005 and 2015. If we look at microplegia, looking at low cardiac output syndrome, this is a propensity match comparison published in 2012. 2,600 patients, retrospective study, prospectively collected data, microplegia versus eight to one blood cardioplegia. The microplegia offered lower low cardiac output syndrome, but no difference in hospital mortality. The microplegia group is, as in a lot of these studies, was the latter group, and there was possible influence noted of continued improvement in the perioperative care over time. Again, the water gets a little muddy. If one looks at Del Nido versus Bugberg cardioplegia in an isolated adult valve surgery population, uh, this is a retrospective study, spanned three years, looked at consecutive patients, Del Nido versus Buckberg. Aortic valve operations, they were found to have smaller changes in hematocrit pre and post bypass with uh, Del Nido, lower transfusion rates, lower elevation in blood glucose post bypass, but no change in post troponin T values. With mitral valve operations, again, they noted lower transfusion rates, lower troponin T values were also noted. Uh, but they also showed an interesting cost reduction because in this particular study, they moved away from retrograde cardioplegia uh, with the advent of modified Del Nido and moved to pure anagrade cardioplegia. Question of Del Nido in a high-risk coronary bypass grafting population. This was defined as patients with a troponin over one nanograms per milliliter within one week of MI. Uh, a high-risk population, retrospectively reviewed, propensity matched, 88 patients. Whole blood cardioplegia versus Del Nido cardioplegia. The whole blood was an earlier cohort than the Del Nido group. Uh, no difference in hospital mortality, no difference in inotrope or circulatory support. They did see shorter pump runs and cross clamp times due to the lack of need to redose. And since that study, they comment that they've used the modified Del Nido uh, on all cardiac surgery patients since the study in 2011. So they became convinced. Um, if you look at data from Boston Children's, obviously they are huge Del Nido fans. They've used it for over 20 years by their own reports, and they use it on all patients from neonates to older adults and seem to be pleased with the results. So clearly it stood the test of time. If one looks at custodial versus blood cardioplegia, this is an Australian experience published in 2013. This is custodial um, versus tepid blood. It's prospective, single center, all procedures between 05 and 2011, propensity match scoring, 1,900 patients, um, a majority of which received blood cardioplegia. That's one of the flaws of the study. Um, there was no statistically significant difference in the variables at which they looked. 30-day mortality, return to the OR, stroke, renal failure, readmission within 30 days, mortality, morbidities, uh, MI, balloon pump usage, or prolonged vent. So basically, not a lot of difference between the two in the end game. Their conclusions were custodial is convenient, simple, and at least as safe as tepid blood cardioplegia for MI protection and complex cardiac operations, but they too recommended a randomized prospective comparison. If one looks at uh, a study published in 2013 as well, looking at custodial uh, versus conventional cardioplegia, um, 14 studies were analyzed, no differences in mortality, a trend toward increased V-fib in the custodial group, but it did not reach statistical significance. And they actually looked at a heart transplant subpopulation and found no difference between conventional cardioplegia and custodial. Again, smaller studies and non-randomized. 
you're noticing a trend. So in conclusion, I think based on what's in the literature to date, um, we have a good understanding of the need to protect the heart and the need to have an appropriate substrate. Cardioplegia is an integral part of any perioperative planning for cardiac surgery. We can all agree on that. Longer acting cardioplegia solutions have immediate technical advantages when compared with conventional blood cardioplegia. This comes in handy with minimally invasive cases. There's a longer redosing interval, so your procedure isn't interrupted by the need to give more cardioplegia. Potential shortening of case times, which all of us are uh, interested in preserving and getting more OR time, and potential cost savings. So where do we go from here? Basic research and adult heart models, especially with some of the newer, longer acting agents, such as modified Del Nido, which modification are people using? Um, it's not all nuts and bolts. And uh, custodial, the longer acting agents are attractive, but we need to understand what they look like in a prospective randomized fashion. Um, we need to capture data on multiple perioperative variables, intraoperative changes in technique and postoperative care because oftentimes you're comparing apples to oranges when you compare patients in one study versus another. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe and the wow. questions. Yeah, I, I, I certainly have some. Give a round of applause there. Our studio audience applause. It says, Roger, why doesn't it say applause up there? They're, they're, they're applauding, oh, it's wow. all good. Um, hey, uh, uh, I want to remind everybody that we're, uh, the phone lines are open, Raj. They can call in, uh, YouTube chat. If you have some questions there, don't hesitate to do it there. Um, but uh, let, me, let me throw some stuff at you. So we're going through a really sort of frustrating time right now. And I'm, I, I wish some of my colleagues with my group were here um, because we historically used Plegisol, four to one blood, uh, gave an initial uh, dose, uh, you know, right after cross clamping and then between grafts each one. And they would use it a lot of times to, to test their graft, you know, to see if there's any leaking or anything like that. Um, worked just fine, you know, really, you know, worked fine. Uh, you've got some folks down in the med center uh, over at Memorial. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Gregoric, he uses just squeeze it in, clear cardioplegia, crystalloid cardioplegia, it works. And then you have another surgeon came into town and he wanted the Quest Microplead. Some folks I know down in, uh, down in the Southeast part use that, but we're using it in some places. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're talking about adding uh, the uh, Del Nido solution. I'm not too familiar with custodial. I don't think I've ever used it. Is it, I mean, what is the difference between I, it and I, Del Nido? I don't I've know. never used custodial, so. Okay. So, I mean, I just don't have any experience with it, but you have all of these formulas. I think you talked about the need for some kind of a randomized trial. You had these trials that were all retrospective. You had all of these cases that were blood cardioplegia, the spattering of cases that were some other formula. Their results maybe indicated it was better. But when you, you know, when it all comes down to the, the real question is, if it works, you know, and you like what you have, why change? Well, hello, you're on the air. Just hold on a second, okay? Stay with us. So we're all very comfortable with what we use, mm -hmm. but we know that things change over time. Sometimes they change for the worse, sometimes they change for the better, but in general, we need to kind of evolve to where they're changing for the better. We realize that patients come in every day wanting more and more minimally invasive approaches. The idea of squeezing pure crystalloid cardioplegia in through a bag every 15 minutes while you're doing a complex mitral repair or a minimally invasive uh, aortic uh, operation, it's not as practical as looking at some of the longer acting strategies. Mm -hmm. So you can take a patient and use a longer acting cardioplegic solution, um, give them one dose of cardioplegia and have 90 to 110 minutes of cross clamp time predictably, that changes the operation. Mm 
that allows you to get more comfortable with minimally invasive strategies. And I'm not saying every patient should be done minimally invasively, but every patient thinks they should be done minimally invasively. Mm -hmm. So you need to have that in your armamentarium. Um, we made the switch to modified Del Nido as a group in 2012. Um, I personally changed between 2010 and 2011. Um, so you've been using it a while. Been using it a long time. It's not time. new to you. No, and it works. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, you know, seen improved outcomes over that same time period. We've seen exceedingly low transfusion rates. We've seen um, you know, competitive outcomes from an STS point of view. And it hasn't, so it hasn't cost us anything. Um, yes, when I trained, people used crystalloid cardioplegia on a pressure bag, more or less. Um, but I think there are some advantages to the newer solutions. It's not to say the old ones don't work, but the newer ones may have a better operative strategy uh, behind them. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question to that. Hey, you're on the air. Who's, who's calling? Uh, Ron Gulick. Hey, Ron, how are you? Great. Where you work is at, this Ron? Joe? Yeah, this is Joe. Where do you work at, Ron? Oh, I'm watching your video here. I'm in uh, Tampa, Florida. Tampa, okay. I like Tampa. Yeah. yeah. Tampa's phone. What's up? What you got? What's the question? No, I'm just uh, looking at all the uh, cardioplegia solutions, and uh, we had to change, so we're looking at all the uh, chemicals that are in the plesia, and there's really not a big difference in the uh, chemical solution of the plesia. So why is it so uh, different and uh, that you could uh, have a longer rest time because I just think it's keeping the heart cold. Am I thinking something different? So what's in well, Del Nido well, make it so special? I think, if, I think if you look at it, there are subtle differences in what's in uh, um, custodial and Del Nido. Um, yes, keeping the heart cold is an important part of it. However, um, you know, you really want to make sure that you preserve the integrity of the cells. And so as you go from pure crystalloid cardioplegia to you know, four to one blood cardioplegia to various microplegics, you, you have to make sure that you're really protecting that cell. And I think if you look a little further, yeah, the components are very similar, but the, added, but the amounts may be different. And uh, exactly how you protect and buffer that heart may be different. Did, Ron, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. So let me, let me ask you this. The first time you used Del Nido, and you, how long did you go before you gave any additional cardioplegia? We had a new oh. Are you uh, using surgeon Del that's... Hmm? Is we it don't use uh, Del Nido routinely. What are you using? We had a new surgeon came in. We're using a modified St. Thomas. Uh, we give it... Uh, every 15 minutes, uh, we use uh, myocardial temperature probes. We make sure the heart's cold. Uh, but the, for the minimally invasive, uh, we just said, oh, we're going to go for a long time. And we never knew that the heart was protected. And we just thought it was cold would be better than not uh giving the uh, plesia every 15 minutes. Yeah, so, you know, that was something that so, we did years, some years sure. ago, we were doing all warm. Right. We were well, staying warm, we were, we weren't cooling at all, we were staying 37, 37 degrees, 36.5, 37, and all of our cardioplegia was warm. You can, you can protect the heart with warm, continuous retrograde cardioplegia. I mean, you, you can protect the heart. I think the how you plan your strategy depends on what tools you're using in your toolbox. So if you're doing an open case, you can give cardioplegia every 15 minutes. If you, you can give a dose after each vein graft if you're doing a bypass operation. But to our caller's uh, point, when you go minimally invasive, it becomes a little more burdensome. It really slows the case down. Um, for us, it was, 
we were using it for complex cases. We were using it for our high risk cases. We kind of borrowed the strategy from our uh, congenital surgeons. It was working well for some of their complex adult congenital cases. And it became apparent that if we're using it for our sicker patients, what's the problem with using it for everybody and just having people have a, a, a better comfort level with it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're right. You have to trust your myocardial preservation when you're doing a minimally invasive operation. It's not easy to put a temp probe in the LV apex. It's, uh, you, you have to rely on echo to tell you that the LV is decompressed and not distended. Um, so you have to rely on a lot of other factors uh, than touch and feel and myocardial temp probe. Hey, thanks, thanks for the call, Ron. Okay, thank you, Joe. Thanks. Um, so yeah, that's true. But would you would you use Del Nido in case somebody else wants to call? Uh, would you use Del Nido um, for a three vessel cabbage? Sure. I would. Why? It's. It works. 1,500 cc's of crystalloid. Mm -hmm. Now, well, if you well, don't filtrate it, I guess it doesn't really matter. Right. But what about the argument that you get more myocardial edema? Is it just that hypertonic that it doesn't, that, that it doesn't happen? Well, you can or also. Or right. I guess. So, so you can, you yeah, know, the standard dose for Del Nido is 20 milliliters per kilogram. Okay, so a 100 um, kilo patient, which is our smaller size here in Texas, right. uh, would be two liters. Mm -hmm. So do you give that person two liters or do you give them uh, 1,200 and then some down the vein grafts as you, as you do your vein grafts? I think you modify your technique um, based on how long you think your case is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel very comfortable with Del Nido on a case that lasts up to 90 to 110 minutes. But at 80 minutes, if I know I'm going to go out to maybe 120, 130, I may give them another four or 500 cc's. Um, I, I think that's where you have to have a comfort level. Does that depend on how much um, uh, uh, non-coronary collateral flow you have coming to the heart and washing it out? Do you evaluate that, look at that? Well, Bronchial I, I, return to the heart? Anything I, that's going to wash it out on you? No, I, th I think that's difficult, although you, um, you, know, you, you try to do the same things to protect that on all your patients. Uh, you try to vent the LV, you try to vent the aorta, um, you, know, you try to prevent myocardial rewarming to our caller's point, cold is good. Mm -hmm. So you try to keep the heart cold and well protected. Um, I don't know that you necessarily change your strategy based on that. If I had a lot of uh, pulmonary collateral return and I thought my heart was rewarming, I might redose it. 75 minutes instead of 90 minutes if I were going to be longer. But in reality, most of these longer acting agents allow you to do your entire operation with one dose of cardioplegia. Mm -hmm. You very rarely have to redose. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, getting back to the now, the Del Nido has high potassium in it. Okay, so they're all but it's going to be cold. It's going to be potassium, and then all the other stuff is whatever voodoo juice. Buffering is agents, yes. Okay, so. What do you think of this uh, on the minimally invasive front? Since I, uh, you're familiar with the cases that we're doing with the yes. systemic hyperkalemia, I'm curious about your opinion on that technique. If you see any issue, we haven't seen any issues clinically in terms of uh, a morbidity associated with giving somebody up to 400 plus milliequivalents of potassium, um, and it's worked well for us. But I'm just curious what your opinion of it is. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure it works. And would you do it? <clears throat> I'm sure it works for <laughs> cardiac arrest. <laughs> that was I, middle. <laughs> I, as with anything, I think it's good to have all these tools in your toolbox. You mm -hmm. never know when you might need it. Mm -hmm. um, if for some reason you just can't quite deliver cardioplegia as you had hoped, that's an option to do so. Um, what I don't think we have a robust understanding of is cellular edema, uh, you know, what the myocardial cells look like after that versus some of the more detailed recipes that, that have looked at that in bench studies to see what myocardial swelling looks like, to see what washout of uh, metabolites looks like. I don't think we know. Mm -hmm. I think we know that it will stop the heart. And if you're having trouble with that, systemic hypothermia and high potassium will get you where you need to be. Sure. I mean, do, but do you, do, you, do you see the you know, the heart in the same way that you see the brain. In other words, 
Um, you know, we talk about, you know, we've talked about TAVR before here. I think we've talked about stroke. We've talked about, uh, you know, any new lesion in, in diffusion weighted MRI is very consequential, consequential mm -hmm. to the sure. patient long term. It basically is a stroke and it has real impact on that patient's Certainly. Uh, abilities. But, you know, if one does have a little more cellular swelling versus another in the heart muscle cellular structure is can you really see where that's going to have the same long-term deficit potential as it would in a in a, in a brain for example um or is it just reset itself when you take the clock cross clamp off and reestablish flow i don't think we know the answer again i, I think it works but you know is there uh less robust RV function, LV function? Is there more diastolic dysfunction on post-op day two or three than there would be with another uh, for formula for cardioplegic uh, support? Um, I, I don't think we have the data to say there is or isn't, but I do think it works. You've proven that. It works in Texas. I think it'll work in North Carolina. We did it in Louisiana. It worked, oh, it worked there in too. Louisiana, worked Louisiana, so very good. And Texas. And and I don't think anybody who has used it has noticed any untoward tendencies in those patients. So it seems to be off on a good start. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think it would be interesting to go back and you know, for example, there's probably some uh, early uh, 1960s, 1970s work looking at high potassium hypothermia. Uh, and myocytes. Um, I haven't dug that out yet, but I bet it's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll let you dig it out. It'll be the next right, webinar. Great. All right. Um, I think uh, that was a good session, I think. We got a good call. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Sitting in the back? I can't see you because the lights are in my eyes. But if you have any good questions, you can ask them. None. Oh, yes. A hand raised up. No, we're good. Oh, we're just good. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I think, uh, you know, I think that was a good session. I think the ECMO is going to be the one everybody's really waiting for. I think cardioplegia, though, interesting, I think can be sometimes it's, it's a dry topic. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's still pretty necessary. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure what the what the solution is, solution for the solutions um, is, but, you know, it's frustrating for us. Plegisol was on back order. Everybody went crazy. Oh, I'll tell you what you could talk about is price because you can apparently sure. make Del Nido a whole lot cheaper than we're buying. The audience is going to want to hear this now, so, but so on, the, uh, on the, the, the cost versus the Plegisol. So you can make Del Nido for uh, about twelve ninety five a liter. In-house, and your, if your pharmacy will make sterile solutions, and you know certainly with all the shortages that have been uh, for all the various IV solutions lately, uh, in-house pharmacies are very good at uh, putting things together. Um, but we make it for about twelve ninety-five a liter, mm -hmm. so you know it's under twenty-five dollars for two liters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's pretty cheap. Yeah. I know the Plegisol is a whole lot more money, than, a whole lot more than that. Well, it's over a hundred. Well, and and you know if you buy pre-made Del Nido, it's very expensive. Uh, right. Custodial is very expensive. So, you know, in this era where hospitals are trying to find ways to uh, save money, if you uh, if you're not uh, uh, altering uh, your outcomes, i.e., you're preserving good outcomes, uh, it's less expensive. It, in many ways, will shorten your case time uh, because you're not having to stop and redose. Um, you know, there's some financial benefit to the institution. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. You know what the shelf life is? So so let's say we, you know, it doesn't, you have to use it immediately after being made and we do an emergency in the middle of the night. We're not going to get it made in most of our community-based hospitals. It's not going to happen. Yeah. But if it's got a shelf life where they can make it and have it there for a week, um, that would be helpful. It, it has a shelf life. I'm not sure if it's uh, two days or seven days, but but there is a shelf life. It's mm -hmm. not it's not made immediately for each case right before the case. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and it's and for twelve ninety five. So you know. so right. So we we have it made by pharmacy, and it's in a refrigerator, uh, secured 
for perfusion use.